Namaste, my dear friends. Welcome to part five of my journey with Mohanji episodes. Um, our spiritual sharing in the time of Corona. Uh, we have been journeying together for quite some time and in today's episode we'll touch upon some other deep transformative experiences uh, that I was blessed with with Mohanji. So in the previous episode I mentioned how um, Mohanji left the corporate world when we started uh, soon after we started living in uh, together in Muscat Oman and how his plan was to um, uh, you know leave all his contacts and knowledge with his uh, one of his best friends and then have uh, like a basic income based on that company and partnership with him and do all his programs free of cost and uh, dedicate himself fully to selfless work, a spiritual mission. Uh, but uh, that was not to be. There was a betrayal from this friend and not only he not only betrayed but also scandalized Monji. And um, that was one thing that we were kind of really shocked uh, with that. Okay, if you don't approve somebody then you say, okay, I distance myself from that person, but you don't uh, continue to work in that company and kind of take it all because you disapprove of somebody for this or that reason. Um, but that was uh, uh, the choice of that person. Um, it was interesting, uh, years later when we went to Skandavail Ashram in UK, uh, we came to know about another amazing master Guru Subramanian and uh, one of his uh, main disciples spoke about how uh, the Skandavail Ashram came to life and how Guru Subramanian, uh, the same story, you know, he intended to leave his flower business with his partner and dedicate himself only to the ashram and uh, the spiritual work and get his basic income from the flower business, flower shop, but then the, the partner betrayed him and took over the whole thing. So we kind of looked at each other, Mohanji and I was like, yep, yeah, it's a familiar story. So probably from a different perspective, uh, there is a reason for such experiences. You know, we, we cannot uh, judge it from one perspective alone. Uh, before something grand is supposed to happen, uh, there's some kind of removal, maybe some karmas were removed through this, or, you know, it's difficult to say and analyze, but definitely, there must be a meaning to it. It's yet one of the uh, past experiences that we've been through uh, and from which uh, we have grown. Now, um, I wanted to touch upon uh, the price of betrayal. You know, when, um, when we betray someone, when we do something that is actually immoral, there is a huge, huge price to be paid. And very often people are not aware of it. Um, I would just like, before I continue with the experience, I would like to touch upon this just to put it into perspective. So even if it's a betrayal of somebody who is like a normal human being, somebody who is dedicated to his family, his income and his desires and pleasures, you know, not, not, let alone a master, somebody who is like a regular average human being, um, and when we betray somebody like that, there are karmic consequences to be paid. But when we do this to someone who is operating from a completely different level, you know, who doesn't even operate from the mind, but the substratum of the mind, uh, he doesn't operate from the level of fulfilling his own desires, but is completely selfless and dedicated himself to serving the world. So when you betray somebody like that, the price is to be uh, the price to be paid is uh, really really huge, you know, and it doesn't affect just the person who did that, but it affects the ancestors, the present generation, the future generations within the family. Uh, just like we inherit um, some wealth from our uh, forefathers or some debt from our uh, immediate family member, the same way energetically at the karmic level we are interlinked within our family, you know, so uh, this kind of deeds by one person can affect the entire family, uh, past, present and future. And um, 
I, uh, especially when one goes into, uh, in a bad mouthing, uh, betrayals of, uh, at various levels and, uh, or even goes further into black magic and, and, you know, um, like dark energy work. And it's a very, very big, big consequence, uh, and huge debt to be paid, uh, which will take lifetimes to pay. So I remember my experience when I was in Puttaparthi, um, I can't remember which year it was, uh, but I was, you know, uh, waiting for Sai Baba to arrive to the big hall for the darshan. And next to me was an older lady uh, from uh, Croatia. And uh, she said that uh, she lives at the ashram. She's been there for more than a year now. And um, I was looking at her, it was, uh, she was looking a bit strange because you know, it, it was really hot, like even wearing a, a kurta or anything cotton and thin, you were already sweating. And she was wearing a sweater and a blanket on top. So I was looking at her, why is she wearing so many layers? And it's like, I, so I asked her, I'm sorry, uh, I, don't want, I don't mean to intrude, but aren't you feeling hot? And she said, no, I'm actually freezing. I have some you know, kind of... Uh, illness or disorder where I'm continuously, you know, shivering and freezing. Um, so I was like, wow, I've just, ne I've just never seen that before. And she, she said, it's not just a mere physical ailment, it's a karmic thing. So with the help of Baba, I became aware of what I did. I did black magic to people in my past life. And now I'm paying the price. And while I'm in the presence of Baba, the effect is significantly reduced. Like I can still bear it. The, when I go away, when once that umbrella of His grace is not there, uh, it's like unbearable. It's continuous torment that I'm going through because nobody can help me. It's not something I can receive medicine for. And no matter how many clothes I wear and layers on top, I'm continuously shivering and freezing. So <laughs> that was kind of an um, eye-opener uh, for me. And uh, I've just not heard such story before. So I'm just giving an example. So we need to be aware of, of the consequences of our thoughts, words, and actions, and intentions. Um, and whenever you see um, any, any master, you know, I've learned this from Anji, um, even if there's something you don't like or don't agree with, Okay, you have the right to just remove yourself from the story. You don't have to be connected with that master uh, and his teachings. You simply remove yourself, you know. You're not bound in any way. But don't badmouth. Don't go into all this gossiping or even further into scandalizing. You know, because um, what that person does is not uh, selfish selfish work, it is selfless. And then when you scandalize somebody like that, the price to be paid is greater. Okay, so that's um, one uh, thing I wanted to uh, touch upon. Uh, second topic I wanted to start uh, today sharing with is how masters operate in uh, total alignment. And this vertical alignment we know that Manji was doing intense spiritual practice where he intuitively discovered this that he can go as he says i withdraw into my spine he withdraws from the outer world which we call in yoga pratyahara withdrawal from the senses from the outer world he withdraws completely into the central axis and he just feels that vertical uh, Axis, and he breathes up and down. He's within, intensely within central axis. Um, that was his main uh, spiritual practice. Whether he was chanting a mantra or simply meditating, he would be within the spine, as he would call it. Um, and this um, is uh, possible only if one is not pulled out from that central alignment uh, by. Uh, accumulated desires and distractions of the mind. Right? So when we have a lot of desires that are unfulfilled, uh, we are not able to withdraw into the central axis because the outer world experience pulls us out. We have an agenda. You know, at the soul level, we have an agenda to fulfill uh, something. Uh, but those who have already transcended all that and have a higher role to play 
such beings are very rare and that's why what happened within Monji and his the consciousness that started working through him is it's very rare and truly precious because we don't get to meet such people very often <laughs> it just doesn't happen you know look around and you will see that people are mainly in the chase of fulfilling their desires uh, or they are just um, you know in the lethargy in blame game and this or then mind activity patterns uh, inclinations I can't live without this I can't live without that it's continuously fulfilling something uh, so when one achieves that vertical alignment and then when such person uh, intends something makes an intention not even thinks just an intention it happens because he's in full alignment with the existence you know with all the elements with the existence so I didn't understand this you know I didn't catch um, how Monji uh, entered this profound alignment and just how big of a deal this is um, I've seen other masters working through him like what I shared before about Sai Baba Babaji uh, first ever in telepathic communion that then would enter his body and work through his body but um, I didn't you know it was always other masters or other masters working through Manji and then uh, the experience I shared last time in the previous episode about fog clearing and I when that mist the fog was cleared actually I think that was the first time that I that, that tangibly experienced how he simply with complete ease set took over the steering wheel he just intended for the fog to clear and it cleared and so I was uh, fretting and fuming for like 10 minutes already panicking because we were entering the main road there was nothing I could do I pressed this button that button button vipers the nothing worked and nothing worked and then when he took over it, he just it was so much of ease natural you know and all that he does and this way the so-called miracles it's all very natural and he does it with a, like a little smile and a glow on his cheeks <laughs> and he will just do it and he will even if somebody notices he will downplay it or he will not comment about it uh, so this is how Monji operates it's always very silent and it takes a lot of um, inner subtlety maturity to catch it you know to understand it so um, some other masters or gurus maybe are more demonstrative you know or maybe their followers make a big story out of it uh, with Moji it's the opposite and then we uh, sometimes share experiences among ourselves and then we get to realize something you know um, it's mainly like that uh, with Moji so at some point we, we decided to share the experiences because we wanted to help each other to understand the level from which he operates and how the consciousness works so initially it was the telepathy with the masters then it all became kind of one and um, and there's no second agenda there is no big story about it it all it's all a flow it all flows uh, with Monji and uh, <laughs> we are just blessed uh, to witness so much of it so the second time that I experienced uh, something uh, really grand directly from Mohanji uh, which I will never forget was um, the time when I was pregnant with Mila we were in Muscat and it was uh, it happened on Guru Purnima day um, in 2011 uh, we did the so-called Pada Puja for the first time it's the worship of the feet of the Guru now what happened there is um, there was another friend uh, I remember Gabriela from um, Romania she was there uh, with me otherwise it was mainly Indian uh, friends so they were all familiar how it's supposed to look like what are the you know what is the custom or how is how it's supposed to be done and um, Gabriela and I were kind of like <laughs> just looking around not knowing what all those little items are for and there's so many different steps to it and you know the the flowers the this uh, powder of that color this color then ghee then I uh, know this liquid that liquid uh, these leaves those leaves you know so it's kind of like a whole process and mantra chanting and so forth so 
uh, just like with childhood, childlike innocence, and I was just kind of looking, oh, what is this? And then I touched one of the items and uh, it was wrapped in the newspaper. So I just kind of opened to see what, what is this? And then one of the uh, Indian uh, followers, Amanji, shouted at me like, don't touch it. You touched it now and now it's dirty. You know, so <laughs> he, he said there were some flower buds which are off being offered. And because I touched them, they are now spoiled, you know, like they are dirty. And that was like something that really, uh, you know, just like when you have that enthusiasm about something and somebody just pours cold water on you, that, that was the effect. And I was feeling like, really like, okay, <laughs> whatever. And um, so we, uh, that lady Gabriella also brought an offering some, some um, mini cake or something. And then they shouted at her that, that was, she didn't look at the ingredients, there was eggs you know, inside. So like, move that away, that's like with eggs. So she also got it, I got it. <laughs> so we kind of sat on the side a little bit. And that kind of spoiled my mood and I was just felt, okay, I'm just gonna sit on the side and witness how this goes. So it started and one by one, they were coming to, to his feet, offering the flowers, doing the whole procedure at the end, bowing down, and then the next one goes. So towards the end uh, of this Pada Puja, um, there was a comment like, should David do it or not? Because she's also a wife and pregnant and I don't know what was the, the reasoning behind it. Somebody said I should not do it. And then towards the end of it, I suddenly felt uh, the pull, I should do it. I should do it. It was like, a, it didn't come from the mind. I just came, I said, may I do it as well? I would really like to do it. So Monja said, okay. So I put the white scarf on my head and I uh, came into a beautiful loving space within and I did the, imitated what they did uh, with all the materials given <laughs> and uh, at the very end um, I just bowed down but when I managed to bow down um, I unintentionally actually uh, touched exactly the middle of my forehead to his big toe. And uh, in the moment when, when this happened, there was a huge transmission of energy uh, from Moranji's big toe into my Agnya Chakra. It was very intense. I could feel it very clearly. And then when I, I slowly lifted my head back and I was almost a bit dizzy. So I somehow wobbled towards the couch and sat there. And the moment I sat, that was it. You know, I went into an indescribably beautiful, intense state of withdrawal within, complete absorption into the space within. What Monja says, this is our home, the home within. And it truly felt um, beyond beautiful. This is, um, I could put, describe it in words in the following way. Like if you imagine you have a glass cylinder of some sort, like a big round glass cylinder which surrounds you. And within that gla glass cylinder, you have optimal air, you have beautiful energy, uh, you can, you have sound isolation, you know, uh, so you can, I can, I'm aware that there are people around and they're talking something, but I'm completely sucked in, I'm completely absorbed within. And in that inner space, there's complete silence and bliss. There's just nothing. Uh, and that's truly home. It's being home. It's so much of love in that silence. And there's no feeling of time or space. It's pure beingness. And I'm so happy that I had this experience when I was pregnant because I know that children also experience, <laughs> or our deep experiences are transferred to the child as well. So Mila and I enjoyed a lot that day. And um, I, I'm sure it went for like an hour or more. The experience was there and I could not move my body at all. Even if I want to, even if a thought would come to come out of the state, there, is no, there was no movement. I don't even think I was breathing because it was just so still, completely still. And then I remember to come out of the state, it took, I don't know how many minutes, like I first just moved one finger then after another minute or so, another finger. Then slowly managed to move one hand, then the other hand, then 
slowly coming out of it. And um, I, I'm so grateful on, on this experience. Um, in India, this is called the Samadhi experience, and uh, there are different levels of Samadhi. I wouldn't want to go into that, but it's a, it's a really uh, amazing blessing. So in that moment, I had uh, a glimpse of the state from uh, which Manji actually operates. And in that state, there is only love. You know, so even if you were betrayed a thousand times, if you are in that space and then you operate through your physical body just as an instrument, but there is no mind, there is just that immense beingness and love. So if you operate from that space, there is no second agenda, there is no hatred, uh, there is no revenge, there is no um, personal uh, you know, need to prove anything, to grab anything. It, because it's already all there. The fullness is there. And for me, this was a really memorable experience. Uh, later on, Manji said, um, whenever we have a deep experience, we should not expect, okay, next time I touch his uh, big toe, it should happen again. So this is the play of the mind. Uh, with a living spiritual master, experiences are always new, always fresh, and very often un unexpected. So in a way, because the scene with the flower buds and the scolding uh, happened, again, uh, you know, I could take it from a perspective of being uh, against that man who, who said that, but then actually because he did that, there was an ego bashing that happened. You know, it, my ego was, was reduced in that moment, and maybe thanks to that, it contributed for me to have this experience. So we never know. Uh, that's why uh, it's silly to uh, take anything personally. You know, when we are on spiritual path, even if people do something against us, um, you know, we should not take it personally too much. You know, the, we always give it a higher meaning because it's actually true. Very often people do things unconsciously. It just kind of happens in us for their own in our state or whatever, but there would be a, a reason for it. Uh, maybe this man who betrayed Monji took over the companies, he removed something and Monji could start the mission in a grand way and maybe set himself fully on the track because there was something was removed. With this flower bud, something was removed, I could get into Samadhi state. So in the end, uh, it's all good. <laughs> that, is, that is my point. Um, now, um, when Monji transfers experiences um, and maybe performs the so-called miracles, he plays it, plays it down for another reason, because very often uh, people don't have the maturity to handle it. So I've seen examples of that. For example, <laughs> uh, there was um, when he started giving those initial initiations to Shaktipad, as I said before, we call it Shaktipad, when somebody else is initiated. And um, there, there would be like this strong reactions happening. In my case, it was the floating on the waves and the bliss. There was another man uh, who, when he received initiation, the th finger remained on the forehead and it, it literally looked like a little flame on his forehead. And whoever looked at him was like, What's that flame on your forehead? So he got like really, uh, actually his spiritual ego got boosted a lot. And um, the clarity with which he spoke was greater and the uh, efficiency of his sessions, uh, yoga and some lectures that he was anyway doing from before were kind of greater. So he thought it's from him, you know, that he is now something special and that he himself can become a guru, you know. So he literally got carried away with it. And um, not understanding the, the force that, was, that, that came to him through, through this experience. So basically this is, uh, <laughs> the, this is the illusion of the mind and this is how um, you know, our spiritual ego can take us for a ride. Uh, I can give my own <laughs> experience from, I think it was two years ago when we were in London. Uh, we started, um, a couple of years back, we started with the Maithri method uh, uh, for inner alignment, deep, deep cleansing all the way to the causal layer and uh, uh, self-healing. So you could say it's uh, something that brings you into mode of self-healing and actually healing effect is there. 
So, uh, and, but much, much more than just physical healing. It's also understanding of our deep, um, deepest samskaras, painful impressions, and uh, the main traps on our path, the tendencies that we are, uh, that are the root of our fears, you know. So it, it gives a lot of clarity to people. Um, and the access to the causal layer usually doesn't happen uh, with the healing techniques available on the market, level one, level two, level three. This is way beyond that because we connect through more than just consciousness. But uh, because the effects of Maitri are so profound, sometimes <laughs> um, it's a test of our ego as well. Um, so it happened when I was in London that we, there was a satsang by Manji and there was some lady who sat behind me and she started getting this fragrance of celestial nectar, you know, what in India they call the Amrit. Uh, so she, she was not sure where it's coming from. So she, uh, for a moment she thought it's me, but then she wasn't sure and she kept quiet. Then she booked a private Maitri session with me and came to uh, our friend Sebastian's house. And uh, I've done the session and when she came out, she was like so blissed out and she had like tears in her eyes and she said, it came again, that celestial fragrance and now I know it was from you. I thought it was you, but I was not sure. And I'm looking at her like, I'm sorry, what exactly are you talking about? So she said, throughout this Maitri session, I could feel this indescribably beautiful celestial, celestial fragrance, which just took me to, to heaven. You know, I was, uh, that fragrance is so beautiful that no, no worldly perfume could ever compare with it. Uh, and it kind of, it's everywhere and it consumes you and it may, puts you into a state of bliss. Uh, so I was like, oh, well, thank you. <laughs> you know, it's just like, it's all, Grace, divine grace, very thank you. But you know, it felt good. So <laughs> uh, we were in the car, Monji in the front seat, Subashri driving the car, and I was in the back seat. And we were talking something, and then I kind of shared something interesting happened yesterday. You know, and this lady came for my tree, and she told me this, and that's why I shared the story about this celestial, celestial fragrance. And after I was done, Monji said, So, what did you tell her? I said, what, what, what do you mean? Did you say that uh, the fragrance came from me? And I was caught in that moment. I didn't even think of saying, this is Mohanji, Mohanji consciousness working through me. No, I just said, oh, thank you. I'm so honored, I'm grateful. And, uh, and then he said, see how easily you owned it. You, know? you had the ownership, you thought it's from you. Can, can you create this kind of effect? Can you do this and that? And then he shouted left and right, and Subhashri was like driving and shivering, because when there is a ego bashing moment, you know, master is like, you know, if you can imagine a heated needle, it's like really almost a flame, and this heated needle goes into this big balloon of spiritual ego and just pricks it. You know, it's not a very pleasant experience, but later on you actually, first of all, you you admit to yourself actually it's true you know if you if you honestly contemplate on what happened uh, you have to admit okay i personally as as a human being cannot produce this effect through my palms nor can i create celestial nectar right or this fragrance of celestial nectar i cannot do it but i quickly subconsciously kind of you know it just felt good to be praised you know ego loves the praise adores it the food of ego is the praise so <laughs> naturally uh, we we belong for this kind of experiences and uh, um, i was really grateful that monji did this that actually gave me that insight so for the future i, I hopefully uh, it won't happen again <laughs> or at least I'll, I'll be i've been warned you know <laughs> um okay so back to the um experiences of our uh, challenges uh, on, on the path. I'll touch upon that now uh, as well. Um, our journey uh, through the mission, as it continued, uh, there, there were moments when the attacks on Manji came in waves, you know, and um, these, uh, when, the, and when the attacks would come, it's usually most unexpected. 
and we wouldn't know what to do. So I remember one attack that happened when we were in Muscat. Uh, there were really heavy energies and it physically affected Manji. Like uh, I've seen once when there were some beings, dark, dark energy beings that tried to attack Manji's heart and they aimed for the heart but they missed and there was a bruise physically on the body. And then he looked at them intensely and just sent energy from the third eye into them and they all scattered. But I could not look into his eyes in that moment. It was that strong Shiva Tattva. So Monji is mainly Shiva principle. And uh, Shiva, Shiva's main quality is innocence. You know, he innocently trusts people. He just gives with all his heart, he just gives. Doesn't leave anything in stages or increments. He just gives. So that's uh, what we have witnessed uh, about Manji. And when the attacks happened on him, um, it was always very, very beyond anything and any of us could handle. And it was only the masters that could save him because he doesn't have his personal agenda. He is the extended arm of the tradition. And that's what he always says. So if they have put me in this position to do this work, they will also take care of me. And it's usually, you know, we go through a bit of churning and then in the last minute, the help comes. Uh, that was my experience so far. So when one attack happened, I'll never forget how uh, they attacked the main area for which Moranji operates, which is his spine. You know, he's all about the spine and the vertical alignment. And, you know, when we get initiation from Moranji, we can feel that uh, energy through the spine and then it also manifests as the energy through the palms and the forehead. So this is the experiential aspect of connect, connecting deeply with Mohanji's consciousness because he also operates in the same way and of course much more than we who connected him. Uh, so they attacked the spine and the spine curved from down and up so it was literally like, like this, like S-shaped. And he, he was like almost like walking like that and he was in pain and he couldn't sleep and uh, it, was, it was really tough. So it, this went on for a couple of days and I was asking, should we go to, you know, the doctor, should we go to... There was actually no point to go because he knew what this was. It's not like he picked up something heavy and then there was a, <laughs> a sprain in the, in the lower back. No, that's not what that is. So then, couple of us gathered and we said, okay, well, what can we do, you know? So we came up with this idea, we're going to do Arati, you know? Uh, so Arati uh, is the sacred moment um, of offering the five flames, which represent the five elements, and you connect with the love in the heart, the devotion, and then with that energy, with that intention, you start moving the Pancha Arati lamp with the five flames in a clockwise uh, manner. Uh, around the aura of the master, you know, and um, we did we did this with extra oomph, you know, with the with the attention requesting the masters of our tradition to to help Manji with the, with this condition he was in as a result of an attack. And uh, as we were doing this, we were just all really moved. Uh, we cried. It was beautiful energy, uh, but that was about it. And then. One of the devotees who, when she reached her home, she clicked a couple of photos and then when she looked on the photo, there was a, you know, physical presence of somebody fully covered in white and you could just see a part, only this part of the forehead is visible and you can see a couple of grey hairs, so it's like an old man covered in white. Now this was after our office in the evening. We were all wearing our normal color, colorful clothes. Nobody was wearing even a white shirt. Uh, so we were like, who's this person in white? It's just never happened, you know? And um, we were looking at, at that photo and we, just, we were just completely amazed. Then uh, we enlarged it and we were kind of analyzing the photo. We all kind of gathered the next day analyzing and then we noticed that so the, this person was covered with a white cloth and it, it's almost like a potato sack, uh, some, some kind of a cloth like that. 
and it had like a double stitch. Uh, since the head is covered, there's like a double stitch here. And then this lady said, I'm from Maharashtra and I happen to know that in like 19th century, this was the stitch that was typical for Maharashtra. So that indicated Shirdi and Shirdi Sai Baba. So we were like, well, I said Shirdi and there was a big thunder. <laughs> okay, so um, we were like, okay. Um, so in instantly we, we knew this was Baba. But um, the funniest is like, he's holding the Pancharati lamp, but there's no hand visible. It's all kind of flowing between the cloth and the, and the lamp. Face is not visible, only that little bit of hair from here, gray hair from here. And, um, and then on Mohanji's uh, face, there's this huge golden glow. And his palms, one looks feminine, one looks masculine. It was just overwhelming experience. Um, and then on top of that, I saw that there's something in the movement of the light from the lamp. Uh, I was the only one to notice this later on. I, I was feeling the pull to look even more into this photo. And I saw a profile of a child. At that time I was pregnant with Mila. So when Mila was born and I looked at her profile, it was exactly like that. It looked like um, there were two lines uh, there were eye double eyebrows, eyebrows, and then another eyebrow, but it's because of the round shape of her little forehead that the shadow creates an appearance of a double eyebrow. So, and the little nose, everything was the same. So the first time I saw Mila was in the uh, reflection, in the light from the Pancharati lamp held by Shirdi Baba on that special day when he interfered and came to cleanse Mohanji through that um, act of arati, of our love. And after that arati, it dissipated the pain and slowly his spine came back to normal and he was fine. So this was one moment when uh, we have experienced how Amonji was saved. And um, I'll go now to, to end the sharing with one very deep experience when um, intervention happened as well. But this was far greater danger than we, we could have ever imagined. You know, many things that we experience with Monjis doesn't even exist in the movies. You, you don't have a prior notice or a f uh, frame of reference in your mind. You simply go through the experience and then it takes some time to digest, to understand what happened and just how grand all of it was. So the year 2014 came and uh, that was the year when I finally, finally had the guts to decide to leave my job and embark on, on, on that same mission of selfless service to shift from karma to dharma and simply live my dream, what I came uh, to experience with Monji when we started, that my dream of serving the world together with my uh, beloved life partner. So uh, I decided it's time. It's time to make the step. Um, as I said before, July is the month of Ramadan. I would have never gotten the leave from Mercedes Benz. So it was just a time when I came, we got a new CEO and I said, uh, I would like to resign from my marketing manager position because uh, I have a different calling in life. And um, I want to go to Tibet for Kailash Yatra, the circumambulation of this holy mountain, Kailash. And then uh, he was, the new CEO was like, well, I've been going through your file. I feel that considering uh, the quality of your work and um, your performance, you have been grossly underpaid. So I would offer you double the pay, double the salary. <laughs> so that was again, Similar to like before, I got the offer for Jordan, United Nations, now I got double the salary. So it was again a test. But I was like, no, thank you. I made up my mind and I'm going. So with that, uh, we first shifted to Dharamshala, where Monji was, uh, had a rented house and um, shifted there, left Mila with Monji's parents and uh, friend Feroz, who was always helping us with Mila. Uh, Marge's ex-driver, and we went for the Kailash Yatra. Uh, this year, 2014, was very special because it was the year of Deva Kumbh. 
So it is said that one circumambulation of Kailash is equal to 12. And people who uh, go to Kailash on that year uh, have the right to go for Inner Kora later on, which is a different route closer to Mount Kailash, which one is eligible to do only after doing 12 yatras. So it was very naturally very special. Deva Kumbh also means that uh, that, uh, that special year, uh, uh, as they say, gods come and bathe in the Mansarovar Lake. And uh, it indeed was the experience. Uh, when we came to Mansarovar Lake, the celestial lake uh, in the vicinity of Kailash, from which you can actually have Darshan of Kailash and see it, uh, we have experienced, I have personally and a couple of other people have seen the little lights at night. We got, I got up around three o'clock, went to the lake, and I could see little lights changing colors and different hues of the rainbow. And they would come just like a star from the sky, would slowly come down with a bit of you know flow, and then take a dip in the water, then come out, then again dip, then come a little bit closer, then float around. And throughout, while witnessing this, there's a huge energy sensation on the body, especially the heart chakra and the higher chakras. So for me, this was an amazing experience. And I tried calling some other people and wake them up. By the time I came back, they were not there. <laughs> so it was like a play, a leela. Uh, but this was uh, the night before. Then the, that day when we took the dip was the most unfor unforgettable experience. I wrote about this in, if you type Devi Mohan blog, um, um, the mirror, mirror called Kailash, part one. Uh, and I will share a photo below this video about uh, this dip. In, during this dip, what happened, we, we first entered the water. It was, of course, freezing cold because there's snow around. Uh, but as Monji entered first, he kind of uh, made the experience milder in terms of the challenge, in terms of the cold. So he first entered and then slowly we started entering after him. And uh, you know, when you enter the Master of a Lake, you put an intention, you pray for your ancestors, you pray for your family members, you pray for your own clearing of your path, the liberation. And it's very deep and intimate. You take a dip, full head under the water, come out, look at Kailash, pray, another dip. So it's, uh, of course, freezing cold and uh, you're shivering and there's like a huge energy and all this is happening at the same time. So uh, in, while doing the dips, uh, I suddenly got this thought. It was like uh, similar to that time when I had a thought to put my forehead on his big toe. It didn't come from my mind. Here also I was directed to go and touch Manji's feet in the water, uh, when he was standing in the water. So I turned around and I saw Manji like already, he was already in the water for quite some time and he was shivering and he started going out, out of the lake. And then I waved and I said, I, wait, wait for me. I remember Spomenka, my friend from Serbia and um, another Manji's uh, devotee from Jammu, uh, he, they said, Wait, Manji, Biba is coming. At the time, my name was still Biba. Biba is coming. So, <laughs> and then I tried to, you know, as much as you can run through the water. And as I was coming closer to him, there was this huge excitement building up within. And when I reached, I just dived in and I touched his feet. And then when I came out, I came out, inhaled, take the breath, and... Uh, in front of me it was not Moranji, it was like a giant presence. I could feel it energetically. And then Moranji just took some water with his palm and threw on, on my head. But it felt like <laughs> it was coming from the top of a mountain, you know, when you have a waterfall and the pressure with which the water falls down. So as he threw that water on my head, it felt like it stripped away a part of my skin almost, or there was like a layer, a glued on layer on me was like whoosh, strongly and fiercely stripped off of me. And I just, 
I was in, in, a, in a state which I cannot describe. I was totally breathless and crying, sobbing literally, and, and in, in, in a shock, in a state of shock. Then another dip and another splash, again peel. Three times he peeled something big off of me and a um, huge presence was there. He, he was that huge Shiva presence. It was not Mohanji that I would know as, as my husband or, or guru. It was so, so grand. And um, Sumit, uh, at that time, who was the nearest to us, miraculously had a phone with him, which is amazing that somebody brought a phone into the lake and he clicked a photo. And that's one of the most precious photos of my life, uh, on which I'm in that state. And uh, you can see that I'm in, in, in like crying and you know, when your eye, eyebrows are slightly up and there's a mark of Shiva on my forehead. Uh, there's like a, like a flat uh, circle and the, and the three lines, which I, I believe symbolize the three gunas. I haven't really studied this deeply, but I know it's a it's a known sh symbol of Shiva on on my forehead. Look, it looks literally as if somebody uh, ingrained it. You know, it's like in the skin. Let's say if you had a, a a mark on somebody with a heat marked something on your skin and it became like a scar, literally like that. It looked. It wasn't like a, a, some kind of vision or some kind of a imposition on top of my face. It looked like it was. Uh, ingrained and uh, that that photo as I said is for me the, one of the most important images the reminders of this supernatural uh, experience but then when I learned what happened actually at this time uh, it was much more than what I experienced um, Moanji was in that exalted state and uh, he was huge, he was huge, and the work that he was doing at that time was immense. Now we got a testimonial of, testimonial of one lady who was back in Europe, and she's a Sai Baba devotee, she is a Sai Baba devotee, and she um, was cooking, you know, and suddenly uh, she had a vision. Now because she had one very painful experience in her life, after that painful experience she started having visions regularly, and she would see visions almost like movies on the, on the screen, literally. He, she would see so much, not just glimpses, but actual, like, entire event happening. So she said, she wrote to Manji later on, uh, that she was at home cooking, all of a sudden, bam, the vision. The vision is of uh, Manji and around 100 people going with the buses towards the Mansarova Lake. She didn't know it was Mansarova, she, she said some lake somewhere distant, she can see it's, the landscape is different than Europe, very much so. And as the buses are moving, and people are in the buses with Manji, there's also, there are like so many other souls, just like a um, cloud of mosquitoes or, you know, bugs or something like that, there's, there were other souls flying, because they can already sense the time is coming for the dip, and it's their chance for liberation as well. So they followed us. And during that time of the dip, when Moranji, as Moranji entered the Mansarova Lake, they all jumped in. And in uh, stages, one group after another, they were taking dip, and after coming out, they were removing the weight that held them, so they could go into the white light, they could go into the liberation. And this was going on and on. There were like waves of the souls, and it was a huge number of them. Um, and Moranji did not uh, put any break on it. Whoever came, he allowed. You know? And this is exactly how he operates even among us. He never measures, he never says level one, level two, level three. No, he just gives. Because he, he's, that's his nature. So, as he was doing that, uh, and all the souls were getting uh, liberation, suddenly this lady had a vision of a couple of huge, dark, beings, entities, that were very angry, almost like, you know, with the, like uh, big teeth and blood oozing and uh, most horrible uh, vision of the dark entities that you can have, that's about it. And they were big, they were big players. 
and they were angered by this act of Moanji helping all this, so many of the souls. So they, they, they appeared there. And uh, as she was witnessing this, uh, she felt uh, th this, this, this is not going in a good direction. You know? And then she heard the voice of Sai Baba, Shri Sai Baba, uh, Mohan's life is in danger. His life will end now. And she was shocked to hear that. And, and she said, Baba, please help Moanji. The world needs him. We have to do something. Please help him. And then Baba was quiet for a while. And then he said, I can save his uh, physical body, but he will have a different type of death. He will be character assassinated. Uh, because the, the force of this dark entity was big and their anger was big upon Manji. So Baba intervened, but there had to be some effect. And we have also seen this through Manji, like what I shared before, our car accident was prevented. He had a scar on his body, but something small had to come uh, to diminish that karma, but you cannot fully uh, remove the effect. It has to come on the body of the master. So what Baba did, he diminished it from physical death, which was actually prophesied at the age of 49, Monji will leave his body. So uh, his life was saved, but Baba said that he will be character assassinated. So soon after the Kailash Yatra, uh, this process started where people that we expected the least would turn against Monji came up with some stories that were just utterly ridiculous. But there were the usual, uh, you know, um, character assassination is either about money or sex. These are the two topics where you can destroy somebody's reputation. So the all kinds of ridiculous stories started uh, floating around. And um, I remember the time when we <clears throat> we traveled to U.S. and there were. Uh, programs back to back, exhaustion, jet lag, uh, you know, lack of sleep. Mila was small. Uh, I was juggling with so many things, and then poof, uh, one of the waves of these attacks came. And there was just so many negativities. You know, there was so much of weight, uh, emotional uh, response. And uh, some some uh, lady said that commented about me also that. Uh, I'm uh, not um, living Manji's teachings, or I'm not fit to be his wife, or something like that happened. So I was greatly like offended and hurt. And um, I remember we got up in the morning, and it was organized to go into some old forest where there are giant trees, uh, hundreds and hundreds of years old trees, tall trees. And we were taken to this, um, it's almost like a park, because it's very special. And uh, the negative forces were, whenever there's an attack, there would always be an attack of splitting uh, our family. Mohan, Jimila and I would be separated. This was always the agenda of the, of the dark forces. Uh, so one was an uh, attack on his reputation, and emails flying around, ridiculous accusations, and people who were connected with Mohan suddenly believing these stories without even calling him to ask, is this really true? No, they just believed it and went into that <laughs> story and then also started spreading those rumors. And it's, uh, it's you know, quite a shock when you experience it, especially when you serve and you give all you got with all your heart and then suddenly when this happens, uh, it was quite, quite a big kick. And that was the time I remember I was, uh, having these thoughts, I don't need all this nonsense. It's easier for me, you know, why did I have to get myself into it? I can just withdraw from all this. So these thoughts that I should leave Moanji, that I don't need this nonsense, and all that was coming, uh, that these were not my thoughts. And I remember I didn't want anybody to help me. I held Mila on one hip, another bag here, plus Mila's diapers and food, and, and carried all by myself, <laughs> carrying my burden. <laughs> and didn't want anybody's help. So um, it went on uh, and a lot of, a lot of sadness, a lot of pain inside. These dark thoughts, big heaviness. 
And as we went into this forest, just half an hour later, just suddenly the heaviness cleared away. You know? And that's when I understood how great the trees are. Honestly, it's like if you have never tried this, just going, you know, when you feel heavy and, and burdened by heavy emotions, if you're hurt, betrayed, or having negative thoughts, try going into a forest, try finding a big old tree, and you just sit by the tree, lean on the tree, and stay there and tune in, and see how great helpers the trees are, Mother Nature, the trees. Uh, this was the time when I really witnessed this, and um, I did not say a word, none of these thoughts were actually verbalized, and this whole negativity dissipated. And I stood by Mohenji with all my heart and soul through all these attacks. As I said, there were several waves of them. The uh, most ridiculous uh, accusations. Um, I can give an example. For example, uh, there was one lady who had, um, she and her husband of some higher level jobs or something, very official and higher level, uh, and they have money, they have success, in it, but they, their intimate life is very poor. Like the husband comes back from work and sits in front of TV and she kind of waits for him and then she falls asleep and then they, he falls asleep and there's nothing is happening. And they couldn't have children, uh, there's no intimacy, there's no energy or attraction, nothing. So she begged Monji for help, like what can I do? What can I do to you know, connect with my, mom, uh, with my husband more deeply? Now, when you're a spiritual master, you don't say, oh, I don't answer such questions. You know, this is, Monji is a practical guru, you know, so he said, okay, uh, you do this, you do this. So he, he told her, I'm going to guide you. Um, you talk to him like this, my darling, the, the, wear clothes like this. So he even wrote the words she should tell him and um, just, you know, very bluntly used some of those words, then you should, you know, uh, wear this kind of clothes, try this, try that. And later on, uh, she wrote back that, uh, yes, uh, I tried this and it worked. And uh, I'm happy to share with you that I'm now pregnant and my husband and I are finally functioning as a couple and I'm so grateful. Well, this conversation with her was somehow intercepted by one of these people who attacked Manji. And then they uh, sh can sh show the screenshot. And this is how Monji talks to ladies, you know. And then the whole story was, oh, they added a bit of words here and there, made it, and then shared this through emails, through all around the world, and with some other lies added to it, you know. Because once you have some proof of that sort of misrepresentation, uh, uh, then you can just easily build on this and that. So this is just an example, um, but what uh, really uh, touched me at that time, as I said, I really saw that Monji does not operate from the mind. He operates from the substratum of the mind, from the consciousness where there is, there is no urge to revenge, there is no urge to attack. And regardless of this character assassination, which really went on for a while, it was serious like he was not sure whether he'll come back to india like after us mila and i went to serbia he went to india alone because some of these people were could have even planned some some kind of a, a story of putting him in jail and there were all sorts of stories flying around and possibilities so complete fall from you know status, right? That was that. That's character assassination, where you're completely disgraced and put down and uh, you're uh, guilty no matter what you say or do. It's like uh, a priori guilty. You know? People don't even ask. They hear the rumor and they believe it. Uh, so from that space, uh, Moranji lifted himself back up, you know, and continued to focus the attention on social service, on loving, on giving. Now that is not humanly possible unless uh, you have the grace of the divine and if you are destined to actually give something of value to humanity. Uh, human beings can not uh, recover from such a big foot of negativity. 
so from there, I, I learned a very, uh, I learned the, this episode of this. I have learned a powerful lesson that when we are attacked uh, by negativity, we have to focus ourselves on selflessness, on positive action. This is where the power of charity comes in. It's a huge power. You know, if you uh, can just, instead of thinking, how could they say this? How could they, oh, they also believed it. Oh, one hit after the other and continuously thinking about that. If you just leave it all and focus, okay, what is my higher purpose? What did I come here to do? And you just, no matter what others say you do, this is your truth. This is your expression, and you focus your full energy on that. This becomes like little flames that are trying to get you, but they don't hook on. So I had a vision of that when, when we went to Kailash the following year, uh, in 2016. We were at one, uh, we were at Pashupatina temple. When this vision came, the, I saw myself in like vertical alignment, in that vertical pillar of light, with eyes fully rolled up in like Shambhavi Mudra and huge energy here on the crown. And I just stood like that, full attention up. And then I became aware of this huge flames, sticky flames. Just like if you imagine the legs of the octopus, but they're made out of flame. And they're somehow energetically sticky and they just poof, hit you from down, one after the other. So. They're trying to find your weak spot, your fear, your anxiety, something you are somewhere where you're weak. And they keep hitting. So if the weakness is there, you know, uh, your attention will not be up there. It will suddenly go down to address this negativity and this weakness. And then they got you. They got you. So the, the, that's uh, yet another approach to maybe a visual representation of what I experience, experientially felt with Moanji. Um, how we respond in those moments, and if we have the strength and maturity to continuously keep the focus on the higher mission, on, on your seeing yourself as the instrument of divine, selflessly giving with no ex expectation, no flame can catch you. They're just powerless. They cannot get you. So I hope this will help you in your own little or big challenges of life and we'll continue further with our journey in the next episode. Thank you so much.